Hello, I'm Stephen Cherniski, a nutritional biochemist, university instructor, and medical writer. In this short video, you'll see clips of some of my book tour interviews, as well as a montage of print media interviews and articles. But since it's hard to convey the full scope of someone's talents in sound bites, I'd like to take a few moments to give you a sense of the exciting new developments that I've helped to pioneer in the last few years. Today we're at a, a historic intersection of science and sociology. The science has to do with the remarkable breakthroughs in our understanding of the aging process. These breakthroughs have, have shattered our previous notions of health and longevity and, and life expectancy. It's now possible, if you know the steps to take, to literally turn back your biological clock. Now that means it no longer matters what year you were born. Chronological age is obsolete. What matters today is how you look, feel, and perform, a concept known as biological age. Now, through my research, I've been able to reduce my biological age by 16 years, and that's verified with, with independent medical tests. Imagine how that news will sound to 73 million baby boomers who are only now starting to experience the first serious signs of aging. And you see, that's the sociology, uh, the, the coming of age as, as boomers across the country are, are being shocked out of their delusions of immortality. And this intersection of boomer motivation and scientific breakthrough promises to be a hot topic for decades. Thus the need for a credible, articulate, and inspiring expert, someone who can translate the complex science into language that people can understand and act upon. Somebody who can cut through the, the, the confusion to give people a take-home message that they need. I've been doing that for decades with graduate students, doctors, and nurses, and the general public. And I look forward to working with you in this exciting arena. Thanks very much for watching. We can now age gracefully. We can now maintain high-level wellness well into our 90s, probably to about 120. He's written a book called The DHEA Breakthrough. Chernisky, now 48, has been taking DHEA for eight years. He claims it's made him thinner, lowered his cholesterol, improved his immunity, and reduced his stress. You think you're going to live to be 120 and be healthy? Absolutely. I'm saying that, that aging is a disease. And it's natural to respond in the same way that you would take an antibiotic. It's natural to take DHEA to slow down the aging process. You, you can't just wait around. I mean, maybe you can wait around, but I can't. And, and, and my parents can't. And baby boomers can't wait around for these confirming studies. You have to ask yourself, what is the potential for reward? The potential is incredibly great. So now DHEA, I'm sure, stands for a long word. Long word. Okay. Dehydroepiandrosterone. And what is that and what does it do to the body? When you're in your prime, your body produces an incredible amount of DHEA and nature basically does that to get you to reproduce. So she makes you energetic, she makes you strong, she cranks up your libido, she makes you just in fabulous health. And then once you're past that Prime Which would be what, like 25 Around to 25, 35? right. Yeah. Once, you see, nature only wants you to reproduce, and then she wants you to take care of your progeny, and then she wants you to get out of there. Die, yeah. Right. So her idea is to, to flood every tissue in your body with DHEA when you're in your prime, and then after age 25, she withdraws that DHEA so that you will die in about mm -hmm. three or four decades. So that you'll stop reproducing, right? Right, and, get, and make room for a newer, younger model. Now, right. if that's okay for you, if, if, if you don't mind falling apart from age 50, if you don't mind dying at age 75, then you don't need to think about DHA. But if you, if you have other plans, uh, you should really start thinking All about right, so DHA. Now, uh, so you began taking DHEA when you were about 40 years old? About at age 40. And, and just turned 40. And, and what did it start to do for you? What changes did you notice? First thing I noticed was a, a change in mood. Um, I, I felt more optimistic. I felt uh, just better about myself and about, about life. 
Um, the second thing I noticed was I went to the gym to work out and the weights that I normally worked out with seemed very light. Oh, really? Um, so, your, so your muscle tone and muscle capability improved, was improved? Improved very quickly and right. very dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, and then I noticed the libido increased. I noticed my cholesterol Let's level Let's not dropping. rush past the libido <laughs> increase. Let's, <laughs> let's just not sail through that like, uh, like without going into gross detail. You were, you were stronger. Well, the interesting thing is, it's one of the ironies of life that by the time a man gets to the point where he's got some endurance, <laughs> his performance starts to decrease mm -hmm. and his desire for sex starts to decrease. DHA can change that very, very quickly um, and reliably. Uh, so for men, it's a, it's a wonderful boost in that respect, and but also for women. How much do we take? Well, first, you read my book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because, okay. Because, okay. Read the book. <laughs> that was because, good. Okay. Read the book. Because you, you can't just... <laughs> you can't just go popping pills. You can't hands. just go popping pills. And you, right. you really shouldn't. This is a right. hormone. It's bioactive. You really should do it with intelligence. And I recommend you, you work with your doctor. Okay. Um, yeah. And your doctor is going to be able to measure your DHA level now. In other words, mm -hmm. how much is my body producing now? And then you know about how much you want to take to bring yourself back up to that 25-year-old prime peak. So, like, if I go to my doctor and he says, well, you're, you're absolutely normal for a 36-year-old woman, I say to him. You say to him, oh, no, <laughs> because you don't want to be normal, normal for a 35-year-old okay. woman. Right, she, you want she's me. not very normal. You want to be anyway. normal for a 25-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Tablets. It's just a tablet. Mm -hmm. just what a tablet. does it do for you? To rattle off all the things that it does besides slowing down the aging clock. Re really, really quick. Um, when you were 25, you had a high level of uh, a high metabolic efficiency. Your body just was working great. The calories you consumed were con were creating energy in your body, not fat, because you were mm -hmm. 25. Later on, your body says, "Oh, why bother making all those muscles? I'll just make fat." Well, that mm -hmm. DHEA changes that. You go back to making muscle. Mm -hmm. um, DHEA raises your immune system dramatically. It enhances your mind, in, including your memory, short-term, long-term memory, cognition skills improve, DHEA can enhance your sex life dramatically. Who is this good for? Because all ages, I've heard you have to be very careful when taking this, and that people under the age of, say, 40s, 50s should not be taking it. Well, no, I, I, think, I think in your late 30s, a good idea would be to go and have your blood checked to see where your, where your DHEA level is. You get a baseline when you're 38 or 39. After age 40, I think it's a good idea to actually start thinking about how can I, how can I keep my DHEA level really high. And you don't have to supplement. In my book, I talk about ways to improve your body's own production of DHEA. If you do all those things and then you need some more, you then can think about talking with your doctor about taking it. There's no bout, doubt about it, coffee is a favorite among people in the Northwest, and that's why my guest today is sure to ruffle some feathers. Stephen Chernisky is a nutritional biochemist who's taught at UCLA and the American College of Sports Medicine. He's also written a book. It's entitled Caffeine Blues, Wake Up to the Hidden Dangers of America's Number One Drug. Thanks for joining us today. You know, there have been a lot of conflicting research done on the effects of caffeine, and what does your research show? Research shows, number one, <coughs> that it's harmful, number two, that it's addictive, and number three, that people are consuming more than they think they're consuming. Uh, people say, oh, I only drink uh, two cups a day, but the cup is 36 ounces or 42 ounces. Um, so it's really something that you need to just get some information about, and that's what Caffeine Blues is all about. Mm -hmm. Now, just how addictive is caffeine? Addictive enough so that in, a, in, a, in one definitive study, one cup of coffee was enough to cause addiction. Two uh, soft drinks per day could cause people to go into withdrawal when they didn't have their fix. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we know coffee and soft drinks have caffeine, but there are other foods out there that we don't even realize we're getting caffeine when we're eating them, right? A lot of them. I mean, you go to a, a store, a convenience store, a health food store, and you'll find dozens of products that are called energy products. Most of those contain caffeine or a related alkaloid called ephedrine, and they don't even have to disclose that on the label. Okay, so what kind of things should we look for on the labels? I mean, it comes under other names, right? Mm, Not other names just caffeine. Like, uh, other names like uh, guarana, bisinet, kola nut, ma huang, ephedra. These are all central nervous system stimulants in a plant package. Okay, so if we see those, we know that we're getting caffeine and, and uh, does it pose caffeine, does it pose particular health risks for women? Particularly, yes, because women detoxify caffeine slower than men, so the, the, the repeated doses during the day will have a cumulative effect, more than it would a man. And, and if a woman is on birth control pills, it's about, it takes her twice as long to detoxify one cup of coffee. So the cup of coffee she has for breakfast will still be detoxifying when she has her afternoon cup, when she has her cola drink in the afternoon. So again, 
by the end of the day, her stress hormone levels have, have gone sky high, and mm -hmm. she won't sleep very well. Somebody who's really taken an in-depth look at caffeine and its effects on people. Thanks a lot for joining us this morning. Thank you. And first of all, let's start with a topic that they were just discussing. It's really a myth that caffeine gives you energy. Yeah, the miss is, is very common because everybody thinks it does, but if you almost get hit by a bus, you'd feel very alert after that, but you'd, <laughs> you'd never say, gee, I think I'll do this every morning. Right. It's stress. It's really not energy. Now, when you talk about America's love for caffeine, there are a lot of addicts out there that have no idea that they are addicts. Well, Caffeine Blues is about uh, determining whether you're addicted to the drug, how it's harming you, and what you can do to get off caffeine and have greater energy than you ever had when you were drinking it. And in your book, you also talk about how uh, a lot of people nowadays are really into staying young, feeling great, hoping to make it through to the next 10 years feeling wonderful and caffeine something that you should really avoid. Well, caffeine accelerates aging. It does it by disrupting your sleep. It does it by dehydrating your body. And basically, it just increases stress hormones in your body. So all those three factors accelerate aging, and people are not really aware of that usually. Do you think that people also aren't aware that when you talk about their kids, you also talk about... They don't drink coffee, but they're drinking another form of caffeine, and they're drinking a lot of it. They're drinking the soda yeah, every ki day. Kid, a lot of my book is about kids because they're the most vulnerable to caffeine. They have smaller bodies. They detoxify caffeine at a slower rate. The cumulative effect is much greater with kids, and the damage is much greater with children. So I think the soft drink issue is really something that parents should be aware of. You may say that you're not addicted to drugs, but 80% of us are hooked on America's number one drug, and that is caffeine. A new book by a Boulder biochemist talks about the caffeine blues and what the stimulant does to our bodies. Stephen Kroniski says, among other things, caffeine raises blood pressure, creates hormonal imbalances, and causes stress. You have to think of the cumulative effect of caffeine, because most people don't have just one cup. Most people have a cup before they leave for the office, a cup on their way to the office, a cup when they get halfway through their morning, so another caffeine beverage with lunch and another caffeine beverage later on in the afternoon. You can have caffeinism and suffer from as much as one cup a day, simply because it depends on how well you detoxify the drug and how fast you detoxify the drug and what time you consume that caffeine. Tell me, what does caffeine do to the body? What it doesn't do is give you energy. The primary focus of the book is to disabuse people of that illusion that they're getting energy from caffeine. What caffeine gives you is stress. Now, sometimes if you're driving home and it's late at night, you don't want to fall asleep, a little bit of stress will keep you awake, and that's a good thing. But for most people who string caffeine through their day, it's a bad thing because it accumulates. And people are consuming caffeine in enormous amounts, much more than they really believe they are. How does that happen? I mean, how is it people are getting more than they think? It happens gradually. Caffeine develops a tolerance. And so in order to get the same hit from, uh, from caffeine, you have to start drinking more of it. And most people have experienced this. In fact, if you look at the serving sizes, this is a normal serving size of caffeine. This is a six ounce cup. The coffee cup. The sure, coffee cup. Classic. And this is a, a six ounce mug. Now keep in mind that all the safety studies that have been done on caffeine have been done with a serving size of six ounces. But okay. do most people consume this? No. no, most people pretty soon start consuming the 10 ounce That's mug, and, average, and then they right. graduate to a, a, a 14 or a 12 ounce mug. Right. And of course, <laughs> then they go to the uh, 14 ounce. You got to have your commuter cup. You got to have your commuter cup, vented lid. Mm -hmm. But you but see, this is no longer enough for a lot of people. So they go to the uh, the jumbo size. Now this is 24 ounces. That's a lot of four, coffee. Four cups of coffee. Oh. Now when I'm interviewing a client and I say how much coffee do you drink, they say oh just one cup. Well, oftentimes what they mean is this, and <laughs> I point out that what they mean is four cups. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, that's not big enough anymore, so people are now consuming <laughs> these oh my jumbo goodness. 34, 34 ounces? ounces of coffee. But even that is not the end of caffeine mania, because now, <laughs> okay. now oh, we've yes. got the, yes, the, uh, the very large... <laughs> <laughs> this is like the granddad of them all. Well, this is, I mean, look at this. The, you, you've got your little uh, gizmo here to, that you can slip between the, uh, the, seat, uh, the, the seat and the backrest of your passenger Because uh, it's too seat. heavy to hold. Too heavy to hold. You don't want to tip over in your car so you're going to work drinking nine cups of coffee oh. 
over 500 milligrams of caffeine on an empty stomach before people get to work. No wonder people are stressed out and ready to fly off the handle. You brought some, a lot of times people say, you know, I only have two cups of coffee a day, and you think they're talking about this kind of cup, right? Yeah, right. And they're not. <laughs> no. that, some of them this are is a six, This is a six-ounce coffee cup, and this is, this is the definition of a cup of coffee. Uh -huh. But do you drink honestly so have, you brought this in, do you honestly have people who drink coffee and something like that? Oh, yeah. No, this is a 64-ounce, a, a <laughs> you know, big gulp kind of thing, and it'll give you about 1,000 milligrams of caffeine. You could, you could kill a small animal with that much caffeine. Um, and it, even if this is a cola beverage, it's still got 250 milligrams of caffeine, even if it's just a, a, a soft drink in there. So we're talking about something, you know, what is a cup? For most people, a cup is somewhere in between here.